there. Hallelujah. Amen. The book of Exodus today, chapter 12. We'll give them a little bit of time. We won't keep you here too long. Exodus chapter 12 today is from where we will minister the word of God. Exodus chapter 12. And we're going to look to verse number 51. And I know the teaching on tithing went a little long, but it's, it, that's, why, that's another reason I only teach it once a month. Um, but we're still going to bring the word of God today that he gave us. Exodus chapter 12, verse number 51. And it came to pass the selfsame day that the Lord did bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their armies. Let's begin with prayer. Our living God, we thank you for this time. We ask you to bless the word today. Help us, Lord, to be matured by it and grow to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. And it came to pass the selfsame day that the Lord did bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their armies. Our title today, Leaving Egypt. Leaving Egypt. Now, there are probably lots of people, children included, who know about the nation of Israel leaving the land of Egypt. The Red Sea, crossing the Red Sea, and all the things that should be taught to kids because it's a historical fact. The land of Egypt in Scripture has long been a symbol of life outside of God's will. There were times that God would command His people, do not go into Egypt. But then there were times that God either allowed them to go into Egypt or he told them to go into Egypt. One person is remember, remember whenever uh, Mary was pregnant with Jesus and an angel or the Lord spoke to Joseph in a dream telling him what? Leave and go to Egypt. And then after, the, uh, after Herod was dead, then he told him, come back out of Egypt which fulfills the scripture about calling about God calling his son out of Egypt. And so, actually, uh, she wasn't pregnant. Jesus had already been born by that time. And so there were times that God would tell people to go into Egypt. But then there were times that God told his people, do not go to Egypt. Why not? Because Egypt was not only an evil, wicked, idolatrous nation, and that would affect the people of God from serving the true God. But also God wanted his people to walk by faith in him and not the secular arm of an established government. Now, governments are good to have when they're doing good. The, Bible's, uh, the Bible tells us in uh, the book of Romans, chapter 13, that governments are established by God. But the people within governments have to do what God wants them to do. And we know that most of the time, they do not. And so there were two major reasons. God wanted his people to worship him and to know him and not get carried away into idolatry, which we know they did. And God wanted his people to depend upon him and not upon the governmental system of Egypt. But of course, there were people who whenever they feared, whenever they were threatened, whenever they were challenged, whenever some comfort of their lives started looking like, it didn't even have to be taken away, when it started looking like it would be taken away, just a threat, a lot of people ran to Egypt. They ran to Egypt. And so, very few were those who did not cave in and run to Egypt. And so here we know about the Israelites leaving Egypt under the great power of God. God had sent 10 major plagues. The first nine affected only the Egyptians. The last one, the death of the firstborn, could have affected not just the Egyptians, but also the Hebrews. Because you remember the story where God told them, Put the blood of the lamb over your door. And when the death angel passes over, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. That was the tenth and final plague, the death of the firstborn of all people and animals. 
It was the only one that could have affected the Jews. The other ones, the flies, the lice, the darkness, the blood, the frogs, etc. Uh, those did not affect the Jews whatsoever. But that last one could have. Was the teaching there? That if you don't have the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God, over your heart and over your life, when the death angel passes over, you will be judged if you do not have Jesus in your life. That was what God was foreshadowing those thousands of years ago. And so the world will tell you, the, the, when we talk about the world, what we mean by that is not the mountains and the streams and the trees. The world is the social system within this world. Now, it does not matter what country you are from or what country in which you live. It does not matter. It does not matter the way th different cultures run their governments. There will always be certain factors that are the same among all governments. The Bible says that there is one called Satan who is the God of this world, and he operates within the systems of government. He's not the one tempting you to do some little bad, bad, no, no, that you shouldn't be doing, okay? That's probably one of his fallen angels, one of his demons tempting you with that. Satan himself works in the minds of those who have influence over millions and millions of people. And so it does not matter what country someone is from or where they live, Satan influences world leaders across the whole world. So the world tells you that you have to choose a political party. The world tells you that you are valued or you are to love someone based upon their gender, ethnicity, financial status, or job. But God does not limit anybody to those things. Amen. That's what the world judges you on. That's what the world tells you. The social system of this world. That's what they tell you is your value. But God tells us that you were made in His image. You were made in the image of God and you were given human value from God no matter any of these things. Amen. So God clearly shows us He was not pleased with Israel being in Egypt. And Israel being God's people at this time, and he's still, they're still God's people because of God's promise to Abraham, not because they're holy, but because of God's promise to Abraham. And all those who are born again by faith and obedience to Christ are brought into the family of Abraham, which means we are under the promise and the blessings of God that he extended to Abraham, that he extends to Israel, so also he extends to every man and woman who's born again. So what does Egypt and Israel leaving Egypt illustrate to us? It illustrates those, not just those who are unsaved and need to come out of Egypt and get saved. It's not, it's not really that, though it could be used for that. More correctly, it illustrates God's people who are already saved, growing and being sanctified and developed out of the Egypts of their old ways of living and thinking. Does that lifestyle ever end for the Christian? It should never end. There should always be something that God is developing out of your life. Are you with me today? Whether it's an attitude problem, whether it's your pride, whether it's your ego, whether it's your stubbornness, whether it's your refusal to obey God in some one or two areas of your life, whatever the case, whatever God may be dealing with your life about at that time in your life, that's your Egypt that he wants to bring you out of. Amen. So let's talk about this for a little bit. God, so first of all, God called them out. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 17 and 18 says that we must come out from among them and be separate. Among whom? Among those who are not serving God. Now, they had been in Egypt around 400 to 430 years, and it was time for them to be brought out. But you have to realize this generation of Israelites that came out of Egypt, they had only been slaves. They were born slaves. 
They had grown up as a slave. They didn't know anything. And there were several generations before them who were born, lived, and died a slave. They didn't know freedom. They didn't know what freedom was really about. So he tells us there, 2 Corinthians 6, 17, Come out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord, touch not the unclean thing, I will receive you, I'll be your father, you'll be my sons and daughters. But what does it take for God to be our God? He said, you've got to make a choice to come out. You've got to make a choice to come out from being like everybody else who does not know God. Deliverance is the message of the gospel. Amen? Being delivered being set free, no longer a slave to the problem. Now, there's some people who don't like that. It's easier to say, I have no choice, than it is to say, I have a choice, and God extends to me the power, and with those two together, I can come out of this problem. That's hard for someone who doesn't want to come out of their problems. Amen? And I'm going to show you something about these Israelites. Most of them did not want to leave Egypt. God told them to leave Egypt. Let me ask you a question. If you had seen God turn water into blood and bring infestation of lice upon the Egyptians and infestations of flies upon the Egyptians and frogs upon the Egyptians and killing their firstborn, animals and people, would you obey that God no matter whether you wanted to or not? You probably would, right? <laughs> All right, I'm getting out of here, man. Oh, whatever. But not everybody wanted to come out of Egypt. In Numbers chapter 11, verses 5 and 6, it says this. This is what the Israelites said. They said to, uh, to Moses, We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. And notice they left out the slavery part, right? They didn't say, and we remember the beatings we got every single day. Man, I miss those. They, they didn't say that part, did they? The very thing that made them cry out to God. I realize the Jews had been crying out to God for decades before God sent Moses in there. For decades. So it didn't happen overnight. Sir, man, your deliverance may not happen overnight. Now there's some things from sin and whatnot that God can clean you up in a moment if you wanted to. But then there are lifestyle choices and consequences that it may take God a little while to unwind that, that twisted ball of consequences that you've been weaving for several years. It may take God some time because God can't bless a mess, but God can help clean it up. Amen. And so... They told Moses, we remember all the free food. We remember the free food the government was giving us. We remember the free stuff. What about whenever they were laying all these grievous burdens up on you? Well, we don't remember that. See, people get amnesia about stuff, all right? See, people begin to, they begin to forget stuff, don't they? Verse number 6 of Numbers 11. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all. Beside this manna before our eyes. You may remember that God was feeding them with this bread from heaven. It would appear in the morning and they had to gather it enough for that day only. And then it would dissolve. So they had to gather enough in the morning before it would dissolve by the middle of the day. And there would be no more out there until the next morning. And he told them, only gather what you need. On the day before the Sabbath, gather for two days so that you don't have to work on the Sabbath. But every other day, gather enough just for that one day. And of course, there were those who tried to gather more, and the Bible says it began to stink and rot because it wasn't meant to last more than a day. But when they gathered for two days, it did not stink and rot because God had been blessing it. And so what were they saying here? The only thing we have is this manna. There are times that you will be tempted to say, what did they say there? There's nothing at all serving God for me. Here's what they were saying. There's no personal gain for me in serving God. They told him, our soul is dried away. For it, when we're serving God, there's nothing at all except this manna. Sir, ma'am, 
The manna of God's blessings are far better than the world can ever give you. Amen. All right. Let the Lord set you free. Let him wash away your sins. We sang about it earlier. Let God set you free from the world's ways, being driven by the ways the world wants you to do things and learn to obey God. I'd rather have a little bit with God's blessing and will in my life than to have a whole lot and be outside the will of God. How about you today? Amen. So they only remembered the things they liked about their past. But they did not remember the hard bondage that made them cry out to God. Now, if you're a Christian, you're going to be tempted with this. You're going to be tempted to remember all the good times. All the times where everybody liked you. All the times where everybody loved you. All the times that were fun. But you're not going uh, to be tempted to remember the reasons why you came to God. The brokenness. The condemnation. The broken hearts. The broken relationships. The void. The emptiness in your soul. That no matter how much of anything you did, you just could not fill it up. You're not going to remember that. You're going to remember the girls and the boys and the, and the parties and the whatever else. But understand, there was a reason you came to God. Amen? There's a reason you came to God. Well, I'm only here because my, my, my parents or my wife or my husband dragged me here. Well, hopefully you get something from God before you die. Because <laughs> we're all going to eternity. We're all going somewhere in eternity. Let's make sure we're ready personally. Some of them did not want to leave Egypt, though they maybe they thought they wanted to leave at first. All right, no more slavery, yeah, no more beatings. But then there was what? Responsibility. Responsibility. Can I tell you that many people have a very difficult time leaving a system that fully supports them. They have a hard time because they don't have confidence in themselves to make it happen outside that system. That's what was happening here, church. That's what was happening here. They call it the Stockholm Syndrome. Stockholm Syndrome, where you begin to love your abusive situation and you begin to have feelings of love and independence upon the abuser. Manipulators know how to work that. And so therefore, there were people who did not want to leave Egypt. They didn't want to be sufficient of their own and with God. With freedom comes risk. Amen? With freedom comes risk. And when they were faced with a challenge and they had to stand up for themselves, they told Moses in Exodus 14 verse 12, is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? Were they really saying that to Moses? I don't want to leave Egypt. I would much rather serve the Egyptians. Were they saying that? They were not saying that. And isn't it amazing how when we want to remember the past a certain way, we will rewrite it a certain way. Right? We will rewrite the argument where we won. Well, no, I, I don't want to get too close now. We've got to keep this Bible in Egypt. All right? We'll rewrite the argument so that we want it. We'll rewrite the, the event so that it wasn't that bad. And they told Moses what? Did we tell you we want to serve the Egyptians? You didn't say that to me. You were crying. But there are people, they don't want to come out of their Egypts. It's easier to cry than it is to change. Oh, Lord. Help us, Jesus. It's easier to cry. It's easier to pray than it is to change. Amen. Mm. Next Sunday, right? See you next Sunday? Amen. All right, let's keep going. When it comes to a choice between serving the world to protect yourself or serving God, where you may potentially lose your comforts for Christ, most people have and will choose the world's ways to protect themselves. When given a choice between losing, obeying God and losing a worldly comfort or convenience or career or money or opportunity, they will actually protect themselves and disobey God. 
rather than obey God and potentially, not even guaranteed, if there's even a potential, they may lose it. Many people will not obey God because many people are actually governed by fear. See, I'm trying to educate you today because under, I'm just going to t- tell you something. You're getting, I, I, I believe we're getting ready to come up on a time where many people are going to be challenged with this very thing right here. Going to be getting ready. If you've been paying attention to what's happening in the world, you're getting ready to be challenged between choosing the world in Egypt or choosing God. Choosing God doesn't guarantee you're going to lose it all. Amen? Come on now. There's a potential, but it doesn't guarantee that you're going to lose it all. We've already seen it one time in this ministry, and we saw who chose what. And I believe we're going to see it again here soon because we're in, in America, we're in an election cycle. Okay? In election cycle, crazy stuff happens. Okay? Shouldn't be talking about politics. You don't. You, what you want is a dumb church. Is what you want. You need to be an educated church. Amen. In election cycle, which is one year before the election, the whole year is a cycle. You're going to see some crazy stuff happening. Crazy laws. Crazy rules. Crazy obligations. Crazy policies. And some people, and probably some here, hate to say it. Once they're challenged, they'll fall away very quickly. The Bible says that God shakes and the dead fruit falls off. I've seen it in this ministry since I've been here. Even when I, have, even when I was challenged with these things, I fought it. And as that old song says, I fought the law and I won. Amen. I didn't lose. I didn't, I didn't lose all my stuff by serving God. I chose God. And it was just me and a handful of people. We chose God and we won. Brother and sister, when you're challenged in the next several months, and you will be, make sure you choose God. Amen? Amen. All right. We're almost finished. Don't worry. But I believe the bigger message here is today is this. Not everybody wanted to leave Egypt. Those who didn't want to leave Egypt were revealed. See, it's easy to play Christian until you got to be one. Can you say amen? It's easy to play Christian until you got to be one. The last time I checked, they were cutting off heads and stabbing them through and cutting them in half and feeding them the lions. You want to be a Christian? That's how you're going to be one right there. Hopefully not all that, but sometimes we're a little softer than we think we are. Paul said this, Philippians 3, verses 7 and 8. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Here's what he's saying there. When I had a choice between God and myself, when I chose me, Jesus took the loss. Jesus took the loss. But then he goes on and says, but I would rather take the loss so that Jesus can get the gain. Amen. Isn't that good today? That's good. That's good. I'll answer my own question. Isn't that good today? That's good. Hallelujah. He said, I'd rather me take the loss. God, give us more people like that. And you have to excuse me if I'm coming across a little bit brash today. But I'm telling you right now, about two years ago, I, go, I, I was given a rude awakening as a pastor. I was given a rude awakening, severely rude awakening. I came here to a, 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 to a vibrant church, all kinds of people. And when they got challenged, nothing was even guaranteed to take away from. They just were told, you can't go back to church because we said so. I lost like 90% of the church. And I'm thinking, where are these people? Who's praying anymore? Where are these people? This person played music. This person was a singer. This person was a teacher. Where are they at? So you have to excuse me if I see what's happening and I'm getting ready to educate you and hopefully save some, as the Bible says. John 8 and 31. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples. If you continue, brother and sister, there's going to come a point at which you're going to be tempted to not continue in God's word. Are you with me today? Hey, the, you know, one of the best, uh, one of the most effective tools the devil has is this. Divide and what? Conquer. Divide and conquer. If he can't divide us on black, white, Hispanic, Filipino, Korean, Japanese, German, whatever, if he can't divide us on that, I say us, I don't I mean the whole 
church, you know, of God everywhere. He can't divide us over politics, he'll, and he can't divide us over skin color. What did he do a few years ago? Essential and what? Y'all remember? Non-essential. Essential and non-essential. Let me tell you something. Everybody's essential, amen? Everyone's essential. If you fell into that, well, <laughs> I'm essential, then you fell into the trap of the devil. You fell into the trap of the devil because what he does is make some people lift themselves up over others. Why am I being so straightforward? Because this ain't happen as soon as next month. And this thing is going to start getting shaken. Amen? It may. And they may tell you, well, we're going to give you an Article 15. Bring it on. I've got counseling sheets in my, my SRB. We call it SRB, ERB. I've, got, I've still got counseling sheets right to this day where I got in trouble from serving God. Amen. You want to see them? Maybe one day, all right? The counseling sheet that said, you can't do this and neither can your wife, but they didn't let me sign it and they didn't let me rebut it, which means it's not a real counseling, right? And so therefore, here's what we're bringing out. We're going to get ready to close. Leaving Egypt. The devil is the same devil. We're no better than the Israelites. We're no better than the Israelites in the book of Exodus. We're no better than previous generations. Can you say amen today? We're no better. Here's what will make us better in the best way possible, though. Making the right decisions. I've warned you. So when you start hearing all these rules and policies and we're going to kick you out and all this stuff, let me tell you something. It backfired once. It'll backfire again. The question is, who's going to still be standing when it's over? That's the question. It's been a different church service, hasn't it? Amen. Let's all stand today. We'll dismiss with prayer. Loving God, thank you for joining us in today's service. We thank you, Lord God, for being here with us. And Lord, it was a different message. I didn't intend to say all this, but I did, I did know you wanted me to say some of these things ahead of time, but you showed us, Lord, what the message is. Let us learn from the Old Testament. Let us not think it can't happen to us. Let us not think more highly of ourselves than we are. For we too shall face our challenge. We too shall ch face the decision to choose God and come out of Egypt or to stay in Egypt and remain a servant and a slave to this world. Help us, Lord, to make the right choice in a wise way, but make the right choice nonetheless. We want to give you all the glory because we know that in the end, you're going to win. We may not have to wait until eternity to see that. It may happen in this life. But either way, we're going to win. So help us to stand strong and make the right choices. All to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.